So this was big news. This was big news last year, last week. I was very excited uh, to to see these stories come out. Uh, I was super super pumped about it. Uh, the Indian farmers, uh, after a year of striking, after a whole year of of striking, uh, have won. They defeated the neoliberal laws. The the three uh, neoliberal laws that the Indian government, the Modi administration, uh, wanted to put out there that would pretty much bring uh, foreign private businesses into India and take over the agricultural sector, uh, which, you know, uh, I think like over 50 percent of uh, Indian workers work within um, in, in some way, shape or form. I mean, this is the thing. This is the industry that feeds a billion people in India. Uh, fifty percent of them would have would have been completely screwed, completely fucked. Primarily, the minimum price, uh, what is it called? Minimum support pricing is what it's called. Uh, that basically says that regardless of what happens, this is the minimum price for this grain. So you know, um, private co uh, companies and large scale retailers cannot try to cheat the farmers um, out of what they need to make in order to sustain and grow corpse, uh, grow corpse, grow crops for the following year. Right. Uh, they, uh, feel like I should clarify Indian farmers, not growing corpses. That would be a weird thing. How would you even grow corpse? Uh, that doesn't logically make any sense, but, um, but here's what Modi said, right? This is, this is what Modi said. Modi basically said he failed to persuade a section of farmers despite his best efforts failed to persuade a section of farmers despite his best efforts uh that my friends is is code for uh fuck my propaganda didn't work damn it i wish my propaganda would have worked and it didn't that's what that fucking means right uh vijay prasad who's a fantastic journalist fantastic indian journalist uh, and I, I, I am fond of Vijay Prasad. I always get very excited when I see like positive um, brown role models to look into, especially positive lefty brown role models, because we don't have a lot of those in our in our society. Uh, you know, it's like I'm not going to fucking line up with Bobby Jindal, that megalomaniacal psychopath. Now, I've been compared enough to Aziz Ansari that I don't need to count him as a fucking role model for anything. But Vijay Prasad points out that what this likely means is uh, he's going to come back, come back with something uh, new and, and, po and possibly equally as bad, if not worse, than what we saw here. So the fight, though we won the battle, does not mean the war against, you know, uh, neoliberal efforts to take over the agricultural sector of India is over. Uh, because it's not. Um, they, they're probably going to try to come out with a different method of propaganda the, than, than, you know, kind of fighting back against the direct action of a strike. Um, because th through and through, everybody that talked about it, everybody that covered it basically saw it as uh, the, the state uh, kind of attacking their citizens, right? And, and that's how they were convincing them. So, uh, and and really, the problem in Modi's mind isn't the farm laws. It, it, it's not the neoliberalism, but it is it is the manner in which the neoliberalism was being sold to the people. Uh, it, it it wasn't being sold in the best way possible, right? That's that's what Modi is really saying with with his statements like he didn't persuade a section of farmers. Right. He didn't he didn't he didn't co-op the union fast enough is essentially what he's talking about. Um, he didn't really let farmers down. Uh, you know, and the methods that he was using, the, the you know, the what, what he claims that the methods he claims he's using um, were essentially to use cops to attack unarmed activists. Right. A lot of these a lot of these farmers that were going on strike uh, were older folks. They were they were in their fifties, sixties, old Sardarjis, you know, from from uh, Punjab and Gujarat, Rajasthan. These are these are old cats, man. They're not young dudes. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a young dude compared to them. I'm kind of middle aged now, uh, but middle age is young compared to a lot of these farmers. These guys, these are these are people in fucking in their fifties and sixties, man. Gray beards all around. They're not they're not out there looking to start a physical brawl with somebody.
for fuck's sake, if you if you're out there looking to start a physical brawl with somebody, you don't understand what direct action is about. You don't understand what the labor movement is about, and you need to get the fuck out of here. The other thing that he tried uh, with his methods of propaganda was just outright smearing them, right? Smearing them and, and claiming that um, uh, who who was it? Amit Shah, that was the gentleman's name. Uh, I don't remember what bullshit position he has in politics, uh, but he basically came out and said that, uh, you know, some of these guys are Sikhs and they're tied to Sikh terror uh, and Muslim terror. And, and, and they're and they're here to uh, they're here to come come out. Uh, and they're coming in to eat Indian babies. That's what they're doing. Okay, that's what this this strike. The fact that they're they're not working, and and, and the agricultural sector in India is is coming to a grinding halt means that they they are encouraging you to eat babies. Boom. That who you want to support, baby eaters? That was that was basically the propaganda that the BJP Amit Shah was was throwing out there, falsely equating them with terrorists. Um, you know, and this is like this is insulting the intelligence of the of the Indian populace, of the globe, the world populace, the people that were paying attention to this. Very insulting to their intelligence. Then they use water cannons. They also cut Internet access for journalists so that they couldn't publish what they what they were actually seeing. They couldn't do any sort of live streaming um, uh, on the ground reporting or any of that sort of stuff because the Internet access was cut off. Right. Uh, then they used barbed wire and fencing to block the protesters from entering cities like Delhi and New Delhi uh, to to protest right in the capital of the nation, in the in the in the in the, in the, the government center of the country. To really show that they're against these laws, that these laws are not on their side. So these were the methods of propaganda that they were using, and he's saying, ah. Oh, didn't convince you by beating the shit out of you and lying about you. It didn't work. It didn't. You didn't back down. Now, the reason why this is so exciting, I for for me as as someone that is a fan of history, and I and I know I've I've talked about these topics pretty endlessly here, but I do believe that in the 30s, the labor movement, you know, we we had some pretty major victories. It's just we didn't hold on to those victories, and so to me, th that's what is happening here. Um, in the 30s, FDR used the military to go after uh, striking workers. And when the striking workers started fighting back against the National Guard, against the cops, and against the military, and, and it did get violent because capitalists made it violent, um, FDR had no other option. He was out of options. He, he, you know, that, that's basically the capitalist option is the, the capitalists will use violence against the labor movement and against the socialists and then claim that they're being violent when they retaliate in self-defense. And that's the first option these capitalists will go to because that's the only thing they have, right? Like the only thing they have is brute motherfucking force. That's why the military is such an important part um, of any capitalist regime. That's why a strong police, a more authoritarian police force is is important for a strong capitalist government. But in the 30s, it didn't work. And when and when the people were ready to fight back, which is what this country is built on, right? Fundamentally, at the core, that's what we're told this country is built on. They, they don't have any other recourse but to sit down and, and talk it out. So this is this is basically the same thing. Now, a decade later, the American government came up with uh, the Taft-Hartley bill, which gutted unions and basically killed the labor movement and and killed the working uh, working class of America. And I think that's that's the next phase of uh, of what's coming from the Modi regime. But but they won. They won because no matter how much violence they fucking um, throw at the strikers, the fact that they didn't back down meant that they had to come up with something else. 
and eventually, I mean, it, this would have become an unignorable thing. And so that's what the, but the, that's what the media did. The media kind of ignored it, right? Uh, because Indian media, much like American media, uh, largely silent about the world's largest strike, by the way. This was the world, like 250 million people last year, uh, Thanksgiving of 2020, went on a general strike. And there was maybe one CNN article about it that kind of said that it was it was bullshit. And Indian media, much like American media, is owned and operated by billionaires. Billionaires that have their, you know, fingers in various different other pies as well. You know, and how is that different, right? I mean, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, so that means he gets to control the narrative. So what did they win? They won the reinstatement of that minimum support price I mentioned earlier, which was which was super fucking important. Uh, the other thing that they were talking about, and this was not particularly, um, th this wasn't this this detail wasn't really hit upon as hard even by the leftist journalists because the minimum support pricing uh, was really really the big thing um, that was kind that that the farmers were kind of really worried about, right? Uh, but there there was also this electricity amendment. Uh, which would basically put rural elect electricity in the hands of private corporations. Uh, and anytime you put uh, public utilities in the hands of private corporations, no matter where it is, and, and examples of this exist all across America, no matter where it is, when public utilities go into the hands of the private sector, the prices will go up. Why? Because it's about endless profit. It's about making as much money as humanly possible and and provide less of a service, right? Because what these people, what these CEOs and everything are, are trying to do is to make the most amount of money with the least amount of work, but really meaning all of the money with no work. And that's not me just saying that. That's just what the trends dictate. Every time a public utility gets privatized, this happens. So these farmers aren't stupid. Again, uh, you know, the, the, these politicians are trying to insult the intelligence of the farmers by telling them how the economy works according to the lies of neoliberalism. And they figured out exactly how this system works, exactly what the problem with capitalism and neoliberalism is, and they push back against it. Now, the BJP is sticking to the fact that these bills that they're putting out there are meant to help these farmers. But they have yet to come out and prove that fact. Where, where are you helping these farmers? What about what you're setting up is meant to help these farmers? They haven't been able to prove that fact at all. And they just kind of want you to take their word for it, right? The invisible hand of the free market will guide you. It won't. It'll push you off a cliff and you wouldn't, you, you don't even know that's what happened. That's what the invisible hand of the free market actually does. The pattern in capitalism is that working class farmers could lose everything to make the free market richer. That's it. That's all this would do. So I, I'm I'm very excited that they won. I'm very excited that they're repealing these laws, but I'm I'm uh, also cautiously optimistic because I know the patterns of behavior when of, of capitalists when it comes to these sort of victories. Um, and it's not, you know, uh, it's it's not okay. Yeah, we lost. Okay, we'll we'll listen to what you guys have to say and write laws based on that, it's, okay, yeah, we lost. Let's figure out a different tactic um, and write more, stri more strict laws uh, and say, well, it can either be this law or the previous iteration of the law that you guys fought, right? Uh, so, so things to kind of keep in mind. Things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, okay, I'm going to look at your comments. Ba -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum. I got to scroll up here. Holly, good to see you. Dingo ate me, baby. Good to see you over on the Rockfin. Uh, <laughs> Dingo says, neoliberalism is growing corpses anywhere it takes root. Damn, man, that's some dark poetry right there. That is some dark poetry, Dingo. I love it. 
I love it. Uh, Holly, that's what victory looked like. Holly says, hard won victories, uh, the military company and goons. Yeah. And company goons. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's basically who they would have to fight in that, in that instance is, is the military and company goons. Uh, in, in the case of India, it was primarily cops. Uh, cops were the ones that were going after the, because, because what are cops other than the guards of the rich, right? That's, that's all they are. They're, they're just state run Pinkertons. That's, that's really what cops are. Uh, and, and that's, that's on a global level too. It's, it's not just because, uh, uh, you, you know, I'm just saying that because it's fun to say. I'm saying that on a global level. That's what cops are. Uh, co co cops are the glo global Pinkertons. They are they are they are mercenaries for hire, um, but by the state. It's just they're paid by the state nonstop, right? When you get when you when you become a cop, you you just work. You're protecting rich people's stuff, man. That's that's what cops do. That's what cops always have done. That's the history of policing, especially in America, right? So yeah, I'm I'm excited about this. Cautiously optimistic, I will say. Cautiously optimistic. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm uh, starting off with a little good news. How about that? 